Bill here, which is important and something that, uh, you know, I, I had lost touch with him for a long period of time. But uh, Pat Williams passed away today or last night, a uh, pneumonia. Uh, have been sick for a while, 84 years of age. Uh, we'll do a couple of spots on Pat today, including John Gabriel, his uh, director of scouting into Magic, uh, who he hired with the Sixers. We'll do him in a little bit. Uh, but Pat Williams was one of the most unbelievable people that I ever met in my, no, I shouldn't say short, my long uh, radio career. Uh, I don't think I met anybody who had as and as as much of an interesting background in sports and obviously the NBA, uh, his uh, his bona fides uh, than Pat. Um, and I knew Pat uh, in Orlando uh, back in '86, and Pat saved my radio career. I'll get to the details on that in a little bit. Uh, if it wasn't for him, I don't know if I would have made it. To, to make a long story short, uh, it, he was that significant. Just to have somebody to cover, he was that significant at a time when I needed it in the worst way uh, in the mid-80s uh, at uh, WKIS in Orlando, Florida. But Pat Williams uh, grew up a huge baseball fan. He was a catcher. I believe he was a catcher for Wake Forest. Uh, he graduated uh, in the early 60s in 1962. Uh, he ended up, uh, you know, in the NBA. He was a GM at times for a minor league baseball team. Make a long story short, he ended up with the Bulls in the NBA in the early 70s. Dick Modest crew, a very good team, that Bull team. Chet Walker, who just had passed away. Bob uh, Butterbean, Bob Love, Van Leer, Tom Borwinkle, Sloan, a team that gave the Lakers a lot of grief in postseason play. Uh, you know, never got to a final, but were a pain in the neck to deal with. Great defense with that backcourt. And Dick Mata was their head coach, and Pat was their GM. And then he moved down to the 76ers and uh, was the general manager of that franchise for a long period of time. Uh, did a, uh, you know, obviously had Billy C., who he loved, uh, did a tremendous job with uh, his crew, who drafted, amongst others, Cheeks, Andrew Tony made the Bobby Jones, uh, George McGinnis trade. I believe that was Pat. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the coup de grace after they had lost a brutal series to the Celtics in 81 when they had a 3-1 lead. Uh, Pat was the GM of that team. He can tell you stories about that all day. Made that trade. Cardwell Jones to Houston to get Moses Malone, and that team turned out to be one of the great teams uh, in the history of the league. Uh, they, you know, lost one postseason game, 4-4-4, uh, the great Malone. Uh, that year they lost a game to the Bucks, and then Pat came down to, he left the Sixers, uh, he came down to Orlando uh, to be the DuPont family, uh, was the family that, you know, invested and tried to get an NBA team. Remember, the Disney family had the USFL team with Lee Corso as the head coach, but the DeVos family, uh, the DuPont family was the team, was the ownership group behind uh, them trying to get the uh, an expansion team. Remember, Dave Stern in the mid-80s told everybody that they wanted to expand, and there were a lot of cities that were interested, Charlotte, Miami, Minnesota, and Orlando. And Orlando, and I was working at the time in Orlando, Orlando had no serious NBA history and they had no arena uh either which is significant and uh, they hired DeVos did and his family I believe it was DeVos uh, hired Pat Williams from the 76ers to be their point man uh for you know the possibility of a new franchise and when Pat Williams arrived at um, Orlando International uh, on a weekday morning at you know it was 8 a.m. Uh, there were media there to greet him, and I was one of the media guys, and I needed a life raft, and he gave it to me. So for the next, I don't know, couple of years, because I left in 87, for the next couple of years, I must have interviewed Pat Williams, I'm going to say 100 times, at least 100 times. I mean, everywhere he went, I went. I watched him sell Every They had to sell uh, 10,000 tickets to be a serious bidder for an NBA franchise. And Orlando had no history of the NBA whatsoever. Nobody loved the NBA in Orlando in the mid-80s. I can tell you that right now. Uh, the only people who loved the NBA were New Yorkers or other folks, parts of the country, who had moved to Orlando who cared about their local teams. Nick fans, Celtic fans, Laker fans. And the Lakers-Celtic series in 84 had some traction, that great series 
in which the uh, Lakers uh, blew a series and the Celtics beat them in seven. And I was on in Orlando. We had some uh, a lot of calls on that, remember correctly. But as far as a local team, nobody ever thought that was possible. And again, they didn't have an arena. And uh, tell, uh, when I tell you this, this is accurate. Uh, the NBA, he sold every ticket basically by himself. He did every speaking engagement you can think of. He spoke at every Kiwanis club. I mean, every boys club, every youth basketball game. I mean, Pat Williams hires tirelessly. He put that team together. And if it wasn't for Pat Williams, there would not be a an arena. Uh, in Orlando, the first one, which obviously uh, he put together with the mayor, Bill Frederick, and they would not have any team because somehow, some way, he sold 10,000 tickets. And he did it by, by, fewer, by pure force of his personality. I mean, that's what Pat Williams did. And I chronicled it basically uh, the first year and a half of Pat's arrival, which I think was probably in early 86, and I left about a year later. In 87, it may have been a little earlier than that, the pack out there, but I left Orlando in March of 87. So I was with Pat for a year and I had him on here a lot on our shows. Um, but there is nobody, nobody who cared more about putting Orlando on the map in professional sports than Pat Williams. And if it wasn't for him there, they wouldn't have professional sports today. I don't, if anybody tells you differently, they know nothing about Orlando. I was there. I saw it. I was doing sports talk before I wasn't. I, I, built, I covered the building of that arena, the first one, and I saw it with my own eyes. And now, uh, as far as the team is concerned and the construction of the team, he hired Matty Gukas as his first coach. We're trying to get Matty on today. We can't find him. Uh, remember, the Magic got the team in the probably the winter, uh, the late fall winter of 86, 87. And they got the team, but they didn't get the team right away. They got the team because they went, I believe, Charlotte and Miami got the team the first year, and then Orlando and Minnesota got it a couple of years hence. I think they went two years, a year off, and then two more, uh, two teams, then a year off, and then two more teams. I think that's the way they did it. They did like four teams in a three-year period. And I was in Phoenix when they were awarded a team because at first they were just going to do two of the four teams but I think because they were impressed with all four presentations, they decided to add two, year off, add two more. And Orlando was in the second run of those two teams. But uh, the bottom line is is that Pat Williams uh, was really the most responsible for putting that team. Now, it took him a long time to get good. I mean, you know, Terry Catledge was one of his first draft picks. He eventually got Shaq. He had Hardaway. Uh, you know, Pat went into a president's role where John Gabriel ran the team, and we'll talk to Gabriel in a little bit. Uh, but Pat, you know, had an awful lot to do with the structure and that arena building of that franchise. I went to a lot of his meetings, meeting mayors, chamber of commerces. I can't tell you how many times I followed Pat. Now, it was personal for me because I was doing uh, sports talk uh, in Orlando. And this would have been, I got there in... Let's see. I got there in February of 84, uh, and I got taken off the air probably about two years later. Uh, I got taken off the air because they didn't think sports talk. Uh, I was doing six to eight, Monday through Friday, and they didn't think sports talk was sustainable over a long period of time. So they brought in a, a host from Miami to do seven to midnight, and I was doing six to eight. So they moved me, you know, basically all over the uh, schedule on weekends. So I'm doing Monday through Friday, 6 to 8, and then they moved me to weekends. And when I did it Monday through Friday, those two years, we had the Renegades. You know, we had a little, we had some sports, uh, especially we had UCF football that was just developing. And so I, they moved me from, you know, my regular slot and they put me on weekends, you know, basically just to grease the skids so I would depart. And in the process of that, or right after that, is when Pat came to build the magic and to sell those 10,000 season tickets. And so the company, Susquehanna Broadcasting was the name of the company, the company, and it was an AM talk radio channel, 74 AM, News Talk 74. And because of the fact that they wanted to have a sports guy to make it look good, 
with the DeVos people if they ever got a team. He didn't want to be a guy that fired the sports guy. What That means you can't get the rights to the games. But to make a long story short, they felt they needed to have somebody there to cover Pat Williams. So as a result, I stuck around. Now, I didn't stuck around doing sports talk Monday through Friday. I did it on the weekends. And I did it on the weekends before Pat. Pat was not there when I was doing it Monday through Friday. Pat was there when I was all over the place. So he didn't see the first two years of it. But to make a long story short, I was able to sort of stick with it because I had a sports person to cover. Remember, the Renegades had folded because the USFL, led by the wonderful Donald Trump, tried to merge with the National Football League, which he got destroyed with with that lawsuit and lost, and he took all the USFL teams with him. So the USFL went by the board in Orlando, where Corso was the head coach. And so we needed something, and that's where Pat Williams came in. As it turns out, the last show that I ever did in Orlando was on a Friday night, and it was probably in early 87. So I would say probably in February, right around that time period. And I did it at uh, Manny's Ford, Ford dealership on a Friday night. And I, that I had two guests that day. One of them was was John of um uh was was um Feinstein who was the great author and he wrote Season on a Brink the great book by on Bobby Knight and the other guest and he came down to visit before I left was Pat Williams so I never forgave the fact that Pat on his own I don't remember me asking him to do it and he brought it up he brought a and I still have it somewhere he brought a declaration from the city of Orlando that the mayor had signed with the flag that they put on the moon on one of those space move one of those um, uh, space launches space missions and I had a miniature flag of the flag they put somewhere in space whether it was on the moon I think it was and they in cap and they you know put a little thing in there for me and they gave me that and Pat was the one that delivered it so uh, always close to Pat as sad, 84 years of age. Remember, Pat was an author, wrote a lot of books. And keep in mind, Pat had five kids of his own and adopted 14 from foreign countries. And his first wife left him, whose idea it was to adopt all the kids. And he remarried. And the lady that he remarried, remarried into a family with 19 kids. An incredible guy. And we'll do a little on him today. I wanted to make sure I get that on the board uh, right out of the gate. I can't. There are four or five people. I don't want to make this too much about me because it's about Pat and his great career. But there are about four or five people who in that part of my life between 83 and 87, 88, that four-year period, 23 years old, there are about four or five people that if it wasn't for them, I would be back in New York selling jewelry with Tony Russo. Four or five. One of them was Larry Kahn, my old college roommate, who was a producer at WKIS and hired me originally. One of them was probably Gene Burns, a legendary talk show host who since passed away, who was at W uh, was at uh, WKIS probably Mike Geyer the general manager the other two one of them I'd have to say was Lee Corso and the other was Pat Williams I'll throw in Rick Scalar too because he got me out of Orlando to get me to New York he passed away as well those six and Pat's right there 18 after the hour we'll take a timeout it's good to have you board